thank you for having me. So it's always very nice to be able to see the other Virginia schools while being in Virginia. Uh, so at least what I'm going to be talking about today is some of my joint work with Ben Jones, who is at Ole Miss. And this joint work together comes from some of our other joint work together. So both Ben and I are IR scholars, uh, but we're both also methodologists, and we work a lot with duration models, as you just heard in Dan's introduction. So in looking at our other work, you know, we know it's very sad that not everyone uses duration models, but that got us thinking, right? Even though the things we're writing on are, are well, predominantly duration model specific, you know, are there insights in here that could be more relevant to the broader political science community, right? So if you don't think of yourself as, ah, yes, duration models are the number one tool in my arsenal, are there still things we discuss in our work that could be relevant for you? And you know, we thought about it, and the answer as you may imagine was, well, well, yeah, right? Like there are some things, right? Because all of us are interested in, many of us at least, in events, right? So whether that's a bill becoming a law, whether that's two states being at war with each other, whether that's seeing if a statute has been partially struck by the books or from the books by a court, uh, whether that's a state becoming democratic. Right? So often when we have these questions about events, you know, we have multiple subjects, like multiple pairs of states for multiple years, and these are binary time series cross-section data. So to the extent we have to kind of put today's talk into a research question form, right, uh, the main question motivating it is how exactly should we as political scientists consider modeling uh, BTSCS data? And this is ground that has been covered before. So currently the incumbent approach is logit and probit uh, with some corrections for time. Uh, but what Ben and I argue is that actually uh, you should think about giving Cox duration models a shot. Because what you'll hear me talk about is how Cox duration models can handle questions about whether an event happens. And they also happen to be better at more easily and sometimes more accurately modeling some of the other implications of having panel data of that form. So, you know, we were very happy with ourselves that we were able to find this relevance for others. But then that led us to a second realization, right? Cox models are not the most fun things to interpret, especially if you don't work with them super frequently. So that led us to a second question. You know, is there a way that we could uh, provide a more interpretable quantity uh, from Cox models? So we started working on this project before John and Jeff's paper came out. So now we're happy to say that there are two possible ways you can interpret Cox models that are a little bit more accessible to both you uh, and your audience. So for us, our, our approach is introducing and talking about this quantity that comes from biostatistics, known as a transition probability. And we like this quantity a lot more than kind of the kind of incumbent native qualities, quantities, if you will, out of a Cox model, because it involves a probability. And probabilities are things we see in other contexts from other econometric models. So there, we already have a lot of the hard one intuition about how to think about these quantities. It's not something we have to wrestle with. It's not something we have to spend a lot of ink explaining to our readers, right? And that allows us to focus on uh, the main event, which is saying, given this theory I've articulated, the implications of this theory, this is whether or not it has support based on these data we have. So our story starts, right, as to why you should use a Cox model and that we've made it less miserable for you, right? Uh, with BTSCS data, you're interested in events occurrence, right? So one, zero. And as you know, the primary thing we're worried about for these data are duration dependence, right? So this idea that whether or not you see two states at war today is probably dependent on how long since they last experienced a war, right? So that length of time, right, is the duration, T. And this duration dependence is pros possibly problematic, very problematic, because we know in a logit probit context, which is the current incumbent way to model these data, we know that if you omit any variable that's correlated with your outcome of interest, regardless of whether it's correlated also with your x of interest, uh, your slope coefficients will be biased in the logit probit context, and that it has to do with some of the other identifying assumptions for those models. So long story short, even if you don't care about the duration dependence being there in your data, it probably is there, and if you don't account for it, right, uh, the inferences you make will potentially be off, which is bad, right? We don't like biased estimates. So accordingly, we have spent time as a community thinking about ways to adjust for this issue. So the two big papers at the moment that lay out kind of our current uh, plan of attack, right? One is Beck, Katz, and Tucker's 1998 piece out of AJPS where they say, okay, look, like just 
take time, right, so like that length of time, uh, do some transformations to it, right, using splines, and then put all those variables on the right-hand side of your regression. And now what you're allowing is the probability that your event happens to be partially dependent on time, right? And now you've dealt with the duration dependence from a methodological angle. Uh, more recently, Carter and Signorino have said, you know what, yeah, you could spline, but splines also can be kind of complicated in that if you're not aware of these complications and con um, thoroughly thinking about the decisions you have to make, like how many knots for these splines, where to put the knots for the splines, what type of splines, right? there's a chance that you may do more harm than help. Right? So what they advocate is just use a time polynomial. right? So take t, t squared, t cubed, throw all of those on the right-hand side of the regression. And again, you now have the whether or not your event happens is a function of time. So all of this right, is, is fantastic and awesome. And it has dealt with the proximate issue of you know, there are implications to duration dependence for inference. Uh, but what Ben and I then now point out is that you know, this isn't the only possible implication of duration dependence, right? That simply putting in uh, controls for time gets rid of every single thing, every single implication and additional uh, characteristics of uh, time-related data. So specifically, we're going to highlight three characteristics to you uh, that are also potential implications of uh, duration dependence that from a technical perspective, Logit and Probit can handle, uh, but we either, when it comes to practice, don't do it, or it's very, very cumbersome to do to the point where it's almost prohibitive to do. Uh, there are other alternatives that perform better when it comes to the metrics we care about. And in some cases, Logit and Probit for the really complex stuff just may not estimate at all because you'll run into degree of freedom issues. Uh, so the first big of these characteristics right, that Logit and Probit don't address simply by including uh, time polynomials or some other function of time uh, has to do with the baseline hazard. And all this means is if you think about that equation right, where you have your dv and then all your ivs and controls on the right, uh, what the baseline hazard represents is the probability that your event will occur at some point in time if all of the other covariates are at zero, right? so literally the baseline. And when we're talking about misspecification, what we're referring to is the fact that that way in which you've put time on the right-hand side, right, like a polynomial, say, that's not reflective of how the data are actually being generated. Right? It's another function of time, potentially. So just to concretize, let's say that we have a process we're studying. And in truth, these are, this is the expression that generates those data. Right? So the probability of our event on the left is some function of a matrix of x's, uh, you know, our slope vector, and then gamma times the log of time. So the log of time here, right? notice that this would be the baseline hazard here, because if all of the x's were at 0, this would be the only term that stays. Say this is the truth. Uh, and say now you, you go and model this, though, right? and you follow Carter and Signorino's recommendation, because it's a very simple and a very versatile way of dealing with duration dependence. So what you would have right, for your estimated model would still be your matrix of x's. Uh, you would have still a matrix of, uh, pardon me, a vector of slope coefficients. And the star here is just to denote that those values will be different than they are in the previous. And then you have your t, t squared, t cubed. Notice the mismatch. right? In truth, the baseline hazard is a function of the log of time. Uh, but you've modeled it as a time polynomial. Now, Sometimes these mismatches aren't very large, but sometimes they can be. The reason this is a problem is because while we may not have any theoretical interest in modeling the baseline hazard correctly, it's going to have huge implications for the accuracy of our predictive probabilities, right? which is what we often use to illustrate uh, our substantive findings right, and contextualize those findings as we're saying, hey, look, hopefully I have support for what I've said. This is also um, an issue uh, insofar as in the duration model literature, we talk about baseline hazard specifications a lot. Right? So there are parametric duration models that, like this, have explicit expressions for time or some function of time. Uh, and they're tied to the probability of the event happening. And the kind of current recommendations for these situations is, unless you have a theory 
that is specifically generating predictions about how that baseline hazard should look, you're probably better off using a different type of model that makes no baseline hazard assumption. Because if you get the baseline hazard wrong, right, at best, your slopes may be a little crazy. Not too bad, but a little bit. Uh, but at worst, again, you're going to get wrong predicted quantities out of this. right? So it's kind of a very high risk situation with very little reward if there are no substantive um, hypotheses to check on the line. Okay. So this is the first issue. Right? So for logit and probit, simply by including t, t squared, t cubed, there's no guarantee that you've, you're actually mimicking the correct baseline hazard, which has these potential implications for the predicted quantities. Can I ask a, can I ask a question here? You can. So I, I, I get what you're saying here about, about no, there are problems with predicted probabilities, but do we risk uh, making inferential errors? So it depends. It depends. So if you're doing inference based on the coefficients, sometimes they'll perform fine. Sometimes they may be a little bit off. So it very much depends on the actual like, function of time and like the model you're using. So there I can't give you an always yes and always no with confidence. But I mean, my general, like, my reaction would be, why risk it? So like, it's possible yes, it's possible no. Uh, if you're doing Inference solely based on the predicted probabilities. Uh, we know that CI overlap can sometimes be a little bit over conservative. Um, but if you do the first differences, uh, it'll actually start mimicking the, the, beta, the betas very well. So the same issue I just potentially mentioned for the betas would still then manifest for the predicted quantities as well. So things could go right, but things could also go wrong is, is the, the problem, like, like many things we do as political scientists. Yeah, you comes from a totally different angle. It okay. Sort of, uh, it comes from a conversation that David and I were having this morning. So I don't, I don't work um, on duration models, but I, you know, I look at the, the model and I say to myself, why model it at all, right? So if, if I have some expectation that something like years of life is related to whether or not I take a pill and years of life, you know, I might want a model to think about how old I am. Why don't I just bin or control directly for age instead of trying to model some temporal process to say I'm looking at everybody at the same point in time and I'm just going to compare those that have the X that I'm interested in and, and those that don't have the X that I'm interested in. Why, why bother to go through this modeling process at all? So I guess I have two responses to that. So first, age is still like a duration in a way, right? It's time since birth. But I take your point that if it comes to um, your outcome of interest, like are you going to die or not if you take this pill, those two may not be directly related. Though, again, for age, I would still challenge that a little bit. Uh, but the second thing I'd point out is if I understand your comment correctly, right, um, it was of the form, well, what if I just take everyone at the same age and then look to see how exi yeah, yeah. So that would be cross-section data. So in cross-section data in particular, right, like then temporal uh, dynamics wouldn't be an issue insofar as Right, T is being held constant, right? So it would be the same as um, any situation where you just don't have that time dimension. Of course, as a methodologist, I would say, why are you throwing away those data when we, when we have a way to, to deal with the temporality? Right, but that wasn't your exact question, right? So yeah, you could toss everything out and just look at one point in time if you really wanted. So you could, I mean, you could do the same thing the other way, right? Right, to toss. Toss the cross section and just look at. Uh, yeah, the time series, yeah. You know, which would then point you in John's direction. Uh, but then also I would point out in many ways, uh, duration models are time series models for uh, zero one data, right? which is to say in time series, we're worried about among other things, the fact that there may be some kind of trend across time. So here are the potential trend across time. It okay, so that's one of the things you want to model. That's, that's fundamentally what's interesting to you. In some cases, in some cases, absolutely not, right? But now this would go back to what I said before. So you may not care about what the baseline hazards form is, but you know if you leave it out, that's omitted variable bias, things are gonna be biased in a logit and probit. So you, you know you have to do something, right? And that's where a, like the Beck, Katz, and Tucker piece is coming from. That's also where Carter and Signorino is coming from, right? Like you may not actually care uh, what the truth is. You just wanna do something. But our point is if you do the something, it may not match the truth, and we know that where there is this specification mishmash, it can have the range of problems that, you know, uh, that Dave was asking about. So I guess my question is just simpler, which is what's the, what's the single S demand we care about? 
so all of this is coming down to there's still like some x of interest, and you want to get a sense of x's effect, okay. right? So something completely not related to time at all. Okay. Yes, which is the next slide. <laughs> yes, but. Starting with the parametric model, you're saying my es estimate of interest is a function of the parametric model that I've inserted. Yeah, the parametric model is log time or peak of okay. time. And then uh, you're going to multiply that by some factor determined by the estimate. Yeah. So you still care about x, is, is, is the bottom line. It's just a question of getting to the best estimate of x's effect given these other issues that may be lurking in the data that could challenge the validity of your inference about x? Yeah? I guess my question is, in reality, to what extent does the truth mean? <laughs> yeah. There is yeah. no baseline. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> for, or, yeah. Or, for why you want to say in the world <coughs> there is this thing called the baseline? Well, so I mean, so. A, it does the truth matter? So this gets into the, you know, can the baseline hazard represent something of substantive interest or is it just kind of a nuisance to correct for? Uh, so here implicitly I would say we're, we're unfortunately, we're taking kind of a nuisance approach, right? So it's like even if I have no theoretical expectations about how exactly the probability of this event should change as I look at different points in time, from the regression standpoint, it doesn't care about your theoretical preferences, the fact that that probability of the event happening is partially dependent on time, like whatever the actual function is, like that's enough to induce the bias, right? So again, for theoretical reasons, you may not care, and this is the substance versus nuisance debate in this literature. But again, for the regression, it's like you don't care, I care, right? From just a, a strict mathematical perspective. Would you say it's kind of like a constant in the regression? Yeah, it's exactly like a constant in the regression, right? Because there, that would be the predicted level of y if all x was at zero. Right, so this is the predicted probability when all of the x's are at zero, and it just so happens that then what's left, right? There will still be a constant, but then there will also be t, t squared and t cubed, and that's what you're varying, and that's what makes it a baseline hazard. Anything else while we're stopped? Problem number one. <laughs> Uh, problem number two is actually one of the ones that John was alluding to, right? Which is that there are these proportional hazard assumptions. And if I say it in that way, it's like, well, that sounds very duration model-y, but there's actually a far more accessible way to put it that's not duration model specific, right? And that would be that X's effect is conditional on time, right? So an interaction effect. So say in truth, right? Again, let's go back to a concrete example. This is our DGP, right? Where we have the probability that your event happens is X uh, times the or plus the log of t, uh, plus x times the log of t. Right? Uh, what you can see on the far right is that you know, x's effect is literally conditional, right? It's going to depend on the value of t you pick as far as what then x's effect is going to be. So this is the truth. Uh, but what you model uh, is this, right? Where it's like x log of time, wonderful. You can see the, the specification mismatch here, right? And this is the same for any regression model, right? So if x's effect is conditional, but you don't model it as such, right? The effects that you then subsequently are pulling out aren't going to be fully reflective of the thing you're theorizing about, right? Because x's effect changes across time. So to say it's the same, regardless of whether you fought two years ago or 20 years ago, right? it's not accurate. So it's the case that you can check for this uh, with Logit and Probit. So it's particularly an issue for Logit. Um, and Carter and Signorino do talk about how you need to be pH testing in Logit in particular. Um, however, uh, the procedure is very cumbersome in relative terms to what I'll be discussing later. So there's a whole slew of nested likelihood ratio tests you have to do involving every single covariate in the model. Uh, and then also is as partially because of that cumbersomeness, people don't do it. Right? So Ben and I pulled a whole bunch of papers that cited Carter and Signorino uh, with the idea being, all right, Carter and Signorino mentioned that you need to at least check for pH violations when you're running a logit. 
So these would potentially be the pieces most likely to do that, right, since they're citing it. Uh, so in checking just the main portion of the text, I, of course, did not look and write down a specific number, but there were several articles, like we're in like the teens, 20s, maybe 30s. Of all of those, none of them talk about testing for pH in the logit model in the main text. And if you're wondering why that's so notable, it's because in a, as you'll hear in a Cox model context, context like you always, like the pH violations always come up as far as checking for them in the main text, even if it's a sentence just saying, we check for pH violations and there were none, right, and then moves on. Uh, so what the real kicker is, is that in some of these papers that we checked, they had a Cox and a logit side by side, and they found pH violations in the Cox model, and then still didn't check for the violations in a logit setting. Right. Uh, but the point of all of this, right, is first, as you know, just in a general regression context, if your covariate of interest has a conditional effect and you don't model it, things are gonna start going sideways. And then second, for logit and probit, there are ways to check for these violations, uh, but it's very, very clunky. And then second, we don't seem to do it, right? Even though we've had a piece uh, that has specifically drawn attention to this fact, right, that others are citing. So this is issue number two, right? Simply dealing and including a covariate of time on the right-hand side doesn't touch this, right? Uh, the final issue now has to do with causal complexity. And the idea here is, despite the name of it, very simple, which is the stuff we study is complicated as political scientists. Right? It's not just simply, oh, these subjects were alive and now they're dead, right? But there, there is interplay, right? Som sometimes our subjects can experience the same event multiple times, right? Like you might go to war multiple times, two states. Uh, you might see the same statute partially invalidated multiple times. And where this really comes home in a logit probit context, and this is the example I'll be talking through with this causal complexity, right? Basically that, again, the things we're theorizing about aren't just as simple as you're alive and then you're dead quite frequently, right? Is this debate about onset versus ongoing? And Liam McGrath has this great uh, 2015 PA piece that both Ben and I are huge fans of, so you should check out. Uh, and he talks about this issue in a logit probit context. So we're just gonna be recapping a little bit of that. Uh, and then our eventual solution uh, also addresses the same issue McGrath does, uh, but we think in a, a little bit more eloquent uh, of a way because it's a little bit more easily estimatable. But to now let you actually know what that issue is, since I've been you know, alluding to it, uh, when we're talking about the difference between onset and ongoing, right, in English what we're saying is the stuff that starts an event, as far as the covariates, or even those covariates effects, aren't necessarily gonna be the same as the, uh, the covariates that then dictate how long that event will last. Right? So basically the DGP for the event starting is not the same for the DGP of how long the duration of the event. So to see this more graphically, uh, let's say that we're looking at pairs of states and whether or not they're at war, and we have data on these states for multiple years. Uh, in this case, uh, let's say period one, they're at peace. Period two, they're at peace. And then in period three, a war starts. And that war goes on for periods four and five before the dyad returns to peace in six, seven, and eight. So let's just say this is the, the truth, right, of what we actually see in the real world when it comes to uh, this conflict pattern. However, when we then model this situation with logit or probit, uh, this, at least to date, is not usually what we do. And by usually, I mean the information we give the logit. Um, when it then uses that information to kind of implicitly reconstruct the sequence, right, the logit ends up in a very, very different place. Uh, so two examples of like kind of common practice. This isn't an exhaustive list of common practice, but two of the bigger ones. Often what we do is that we just have like a single column that we call onset. And we decide that in that column, any observation that corresponds to a year where a mid, you can tell I'm an interstate conflict person, any, <clears throat> any year where a war is ongoing, it's gonna be coded one, right? And then any other year, it's gonna be zero. So notice what the regression would see if you passed in that vector. That's one if there's just a mid either starting or ongoing war. Just keep inserting war, I'm sorry. War starting or ongoing, um, zero otherwise. Right? What the regression sees is that, all right, there's peace in one, there's peace in two. Uh, there's a war that starts in three. Uh, there's then another new war that starts in four and another new war that starts in five. 
And then there's peace in 6, 7, and 8. So notice you now have heterogeneity among the observations where your onset variable is coded equal to 1. Because what that coding represents in that single column is instances where, in truth, yes, right, there was a war starting in this year. But it also represents situations in which, oh, like there was just a, the same war ongoing in these years. right? So this variable being equal to 1 could mean two different things. right? It's either a new thing or it's a continuing thing. And again, if the process generating those two outcomes, right, the, thing, the war starting and then the war continuing, is different, you're going to have a big problem. right? So that's the same as in any regression where you have um, kind of an observability problem like this. What if you coded 0 for 4 and 5? I like it. So, right? Uh, his intuition was fun. It's like, all right, well, if, if this is introducing heterogeneity right, for the ones, I'm just not going to do the thing. right? So I'm then going to actually then use just an onset variable uh, that's coded 1 in the years where onset happens, right? since that's the name of the variable. And then it'll just be 0 otherwise. But notice now what the regression sees. right? It sees, all right, piece in 1, piece in 2, uh, a new war in 3, right? which is exactly what it's supposed to see. Uh, but then it sees piece in 5. Piece, piece in four, five, six, seven, and eight, right? So it's this last set of five observations that's now troublesome. Uh, you fix the heterogeneity among the ones in your onset variable. You've now introduced heterogeneity in your zeros, right? Because now in the regression's eyes, these last five periods are identical, right? It sees piece, 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 piece. But we know that's not the case, right? We know that two of those are ongoing wars, right? Mid is the war is continuing. And then three of them are peace. Right? So you've dealt with the heterogeneity in the ones. Uh, but as a trade-off, right, if you do this coding approach, you now have heterogeneity among the zeros. Right? Um, so um, McGrath's piece goes through what exactly you can do to adjust for this. And the solution Ben and I propose also gives you a way to adjust for this, where everything is above board. But you can now see one of the more concrete examples of what I was talking about when I said causal complexity. Right? Again, simply controlling for time, whether it's with splines or the time polynomials, does not automatically account for this sort of dynamic. And I will say that, again, from a technical perspective, Logit and Probit can handle this. Uh, but often, if you want to uh, model this fully, you can start running into degree of freedom issues with how you have to specify it. And I can testify to that as someone that was running the simulations for this paper in the very non-PG words that were coming out of my office that day. My point is simply it's possible, but you may just run into the realities of regression, which is it's not magic. Right? You need to be feeding in a lot of information, and sometimes you just don't have it. Right? Do you see this as a modeling problem or just using the wrong data for the particular question that you're asking? Do you, do you want to model or solve that, or you just should be coding data differently depending on the nature of the subject that you're using that's been specifically coded? Uh, so so say, you know, like if, it's, if it's the length post-conflict, then you're just looking at conflict cases and you just want to get rid of the other observations. If you're mm -hmm. just looking at onset, that's it, right? You're not looking at observations post-onset. You're just looking at within a certain set of time, once you could explain the onset of conflict or some similar straight tone. I guess my question is, do we want to use our tools to solve these problems? Yeah. Is it overkill in a way? Yeah, or do we want to just focus on structuring mm -hmm. the data correctly given a problem? Uh, so uh, first, at least, the, one of the uh, solutions you mentioned is a third one, which is just to drop observations where um, like a, a war in this case is ongoing. And that is one of the third solutions that McGrath proposes that actually is less troublesome. right? You won't have biased estimates. Um, but what Ben and I would say is even if you're just interested in onset, it's still going to be very, very relevant to model the entire process. And this is some of our other joint work together as well. So this isn't something that we just argue in this paper. Because the issue becomes, all right, well, yeah, you're interested in onset. But whether or not an onset happens is also going to depend on you know, whether there's a war still ongoing and the fact that eventually that onset will go back into peace, which is to say, in truth, there's this back and forth that's happening between the two stages. And what Ben and I show in one of our other pieces is, is even if you're only interested in one of those kind of transitions, if you don't model them both, uh, the estimates 
when it comes to predicted quantities that come out of the model will be weird. And by weird, I mean biased. I was trying to be nice. They will be biased. So point is, even if substantively you only care about this one, like from the data's perspective, it's still going to care about the other ones when it comes to delivering you a correct answer with your predicted quantities. Because you think there's endogeneity. So endogeneity in what sense? Violence is predicting, violence in the past is predicting violence in the present. No, sorry, it's not. Well, I mean, so that would be duration yeah, dependence, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So, so in some ways it's like, uh, yes, that is exactly yeah, the yeah, problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just the fact that it's, it's recursive in a way, right? It's like, all right, you can be at peace, you can go into a war but the war ends eventually, right? So it's the fact that there is implicitly like that transition back into the peaceful state that ends up being uh, key and important. Question? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. So that, yeah, I mean, yeah, go ahead. I mean, we see this story today where uh, you know, people who uh, number of peace wars and number of wars is not defined by the duration of the conflict, but as a result of the duration So usually the way this goes, uh, let's, I don't know how long the spell has been before this, so let's just say the spell just started. So this would be one for the piece years variable two. It would reset here, and then this would be one, two, three, four, five, because again, well, yeah, so it'll be one from four, because again, if you're generating that piece years variable from a vector where it's only coded one in the year in which uh, the war starts, then while we know there's still a war ongoing here, again, you have. It would help if you code one from six. <laughs> right, uh, because what that's going to denote is, all right, in some ways, like a new peace spell is starting. Uh, but also the way that we're going to be um, proposing you deal with this with the Cox model deals with this implicitly, right? So as long as you're very explicit about, like here, the pair of states is in peace, uh, these three, they're at war, and this happens to be the first year in that war, and the rest are peace. If you're explicit about that when you organize your data for the Cox model, it'll take care of all of this for you automatically, which is why we're big fans. We're also very biased, but we're still going to try to convince you that this is uh, a general approach that you should consider on the whole. Uh, so what I would very much recommend is uh, where we first start laying out some of this together is the PA that Ben and I have in 2016 where we specifically talk about situations where there's like this back and forth. So in that application, we use uh, states that are democracies, potentially backslide, uh, but then become democracies again. And we show that if you model that entire process, right, the democracy, the backsliding, then the back again, uh, you get estimates that are far more uh, reflective of the truth, which is to say, look, you see that Sometimes there's a higher probability of being a non-democracy than at other times, right? Because states are moving in and out of that, of, of that state. Whereas if from a methodological angle, you just ignore that entirely, that won't be what you see. You'll just see a steady increase up. And I actually have a few graphs of that uh, towards the end where I give you a, a short demo of what this looks like in practice using MIDS, right? So again, I bet you're really shocked given how many times I've said MIDS already. Anything else at this point? Because this is now the entirety of the, at minimum, right? These are three issues that, again, from a technical perspective, Logit Probit can handle. Uh, but simply adding a control for time doesn't automatically do any of this, right? There's additional stuff that you as the researcher would have to do. And there are times where uh, Logit and Probit aren't the best performing uh, when dealing with these other situations. And also, there are some situations where, yeah, cumbersome, and then also some situations like this where it gets super complex and you're trying to properly model everything like you were asking about, where Logit or Probert will just throw up their hands because you're trying to stick in so many dummy variables and interaction terms that it's like, it's like you want like 30 estimates. I have 30 observations. Like, well, what do you want me uh, to do about it? Okay. Uh, so anything else at this point? So we're now at the, the things that, again, why Logit and Probit are still potentially problematic, right? If you don't 
you aren't aware of these additional things we've mentioned and taken the proper steps to address them. This is now where Ben and I come in, right? and what we argue is uh, actually the Cox model can deal with all of this far, far, far easier than log it and probe it in relative terms. Right? So some of it is ease of use. Uh, we do also have simulation evidence that I won't be talking about in the presentation that shows that uh, the Cox performs just as well, if not better, uh, than log it in many of these situations. And also there are some situations where the Cox will estimate, but the log it won't because of these degree of freedom issues. So what's the key like, kind of jump you have to make mentally to begin to see why a Cox duration model works in this setting? And that mental jump you have to make is realizing that any time you ask whether an event happens, you could just as easily ask when it happens. Because right? implicitly in a question about when is a question about whether. And once you make that mental leap, like this is now the realm of duration models, only insofar as the way we usually frame questions is in terms of when. Right, even though it could also quite easily speak to questions of weather. So now that we've established that jump, right, why exactly are Cox models so fantastic? Right, uh, so the first is that they are semi-parametric. And what this means in this context is that they don't even try to parameterize the baseline hazard, right, which was where the bulk of our discussion first happened, uh, with the way that their estimis, estimis, estimation procedure is set up adjusts for the baseline hazard in other ways. Right? And while that, of course, has other trade-offs, like anything we do uh, in methods, what that means as a consequence is that there's no way you could misspecify the baseline hazard because it's being done for you behind the scenes, and the Cox isn't explicitly parameterizing t, which means that there's no way you could get the functional form for t correct. The Cox is dealing with t behind the scenes for you automatically. Right? So semi-parametric, we've now ruled out that first potential problem that we discussed for baseline hazard misspecification, because there is no way to misspecify if you're using a Cox. Uh, the second uh, issue we discussed was that when it came to pH testing, right, which is to say that your x is conditional on time, right, and this is what John was bringing up, uh, but then you don't model it, right, and that brings the whole host of problems that we know, again, from just general duration. General regression models, I swear. I'm for all regression models, not just duration. All regression models, uh, when it comes to interaction terms that should be there but then are not. Right? Uh, for the Cox model, proportional hazards violations are discussed a lot. Right? Like if you are reading a book and Cox models come up, pH violations will be happening soon after. They are like the peanut butter and jelly of the duration world. Now the reason that's relevant is there are very, very, very well established tests when it comes to checking for pH violations in a Cox model. Uh, to the point that they're canned in both Stata and R and other statistical packages. So unlike the process I was alluding to for Logit and Probit where you can do it, but there is a whole bunch of nested likelihood ratio tests that will be, uh, there will be as many as there are covariates in your model. Uh, here it's just a, a simple command, right? So in R, for instance, it's just cox.zph and then the cox model object and it'll run pH tests on every single one of your coefficients. Uh, in Stata, after you've estimated the model, it's uh, estat ph test comma detail, and again, it'll automatically run everything for you, everything being checks for each and every uh, covariate and whether it seems to have uh, this conditional effect with time. My R point is simply, this is like a, a reflex for a Cox model, right? Like you don't even think about checking for pH because of course you would do it. And it's just so simple to do given how ubiquitous it is that it lowers the barrier to you running these tests like, and in some ways just removes the barrier, right? It's, it's that easy. Whereas we recognize for Logit and Probit because of all the likelihood ratio tests, right? It takes time. I mean, we're all smart people, we can all code it, but it, it, it doesn't change the fact that it takes time, right? And more lines of code. So, other reason you would use the Cox model. Right? Just the pH tests, very well established, canned, discussed quite frequently. Uh, the final bit, so this is now gets to the causal complexity, what you were asking about. Uh, the Cox model is incredibly flexible. Right? So where we usually learn about it, if you have a chance to learn about it in grad school, is right, like usually in a medical context, right? like someone's alive and then they're not, and that's the end of it, which is to say just a very simple, like you 
your subjects experience the event once, and then they're literally done, right? Never to be seen again. Uh, a Cox model can actually do a bunch more than just that. Right? Uh, so Brad Jones and Gina Branton first point this out in their 2005 SPPQ piece that you know logit and probit are great but cox models can do the same thing and more so for instance maybe you have not just one event you're interested in but two and it's a question of which of these two happens first right? cox model can handle that as can a logit but just cox can handle it much easier uh, cox can also handle easier if your subjects can experience the same event repeatedly like war for instance right we're experiencing a war once doesn't mean that you can't experience another one in the future, right? There may be this back and forth. Uh, so Jones and Branton kind of established that point, and then Ben and I expand on it in our PA and say there's actually way more that the Cox can do beyond just these kind of simple competing risks and repeated event structures. Uh, they can do things like if there are sequential events, right? So you have to experience like some second event before you can be eligible to experience a third event can do things where there are multiple stages, like multiple ways in which uh, your events could occur. And then, depending on those events, different things could happen after. There's a lot. And you can tell there's a lot, because I'm starting to describe all of it. So please do look in the PA, because we have lots of different diagrams about different ways in which you could model your process of interest. Uh, because again, the process of interests for us as political scientists is usually pretty complex, right? Not just a simple, uh, your subject experiences it once and then it's all over. And again, that complexity matters for inference, right? Not necessarily because you know, we want to get it right, though that's fantastic if we do, let's be very clear. But again, just because there are practical ramifications to not getting it right, right? So it's not just point, it is like a philosophical debate. Like it's like, no, your inferences may be off if you don't. So let's say I've convinced you. Of course, as academics, we are both you know, attentive and cynical. So your question at this point is, of course, well then, fine, if the Cox can do all of these things, why aren't we doing it already, right, if it has all of these properties? And this is now where it comes to interpreting the Cox model. So this is an actual real live quote out of a uh, 2015 JOP that is looking at whether or not a statute is partially invalidated off the books. And the authors are discussing their modeling choices. And what they say is the following, so this approach, and they ended up using a logit with time polynomials, uh, is functionally equivalent to a traditional duration analysis, which you now know is true from listening to the first half of the talk, and it offers a clearer interpretation. And it's that clearer interpretation part that uh, we would contend, and at least one other person in this room would contend, is one of the reasons why uh, Cox models kind of get a bad rap, just because when it comes to them versus the other models we're familiar with. Um, they're kind of a different animal, doing the same thing, but have enough differences that it makes people pause. And as far as what those differences are, this also is something John mentioned earlier, right, uh, these models are proportional hazard models. And what you can just take that to mean at the moment for our discussion is like any regression model, right? like you're making an assumption in its innards about what it is uh, you're trying to get a handle on, whether it's some continuous quantity whether it's something like predicting a count, whether it's something like the probability of an event happening. Uh, for the Cox, it's structured around the hazard, right? Like this is its key quantity. This is the kind of engine that drives the model. And in a Cox context, what the hazard represents is the following. The risk of your event of interest happening for some infinitesimally small increase in T. Yeah. Right? Not the most intuitive of definitions. And again, yes, we are smart, intelligent people. But everything does not need to be a battle, right? And especially as you saw in the previous quotes, like there are other alternatives where there is no battle, right? Like probabilities are very easy for us to think about, right? Like done. The reason now that the hazard is relevant right, is because the Cox is a hazard-based model. A lot of the kind of incumbent interpretation approaches are also based around the hazard, right? So you're taking an already hard to interpret quantity that doesn't appear anywhere else really in regression models, uh, with the key exception being inverse Mills ratios out of Heckman selection models, that is a hazard. Otherwise, they don't really appear anywhere. Taking that really hard to understand quantity and then transforming it further and interpreting that. So the kind of two usual suspects, pre, John, and Jeff, Right? Uh, one of them is hazard ratios. So this idea that if you calculate, like for a covariate profile, the predicted hazard 
So maybe you set everything in its median. And then you increase your covariate of interest by one and calculate that predicted hazard. Uh, the hazard ratio is describing how many times larger or smaller this scenario's hazard is uh, than this one, right? So for anyone uh, that had to suffer through Microsoft Word at any point, this would be the equivalent of like holding shift and then making the picture larger or smaller, <laughs> right? So how many times larger or smaller is the hazard? So again, like we're smart people, right? Like you, yes, we can think through it. But again, it's like, all right, well, now you also have to describe what a hazard is, right? Again, in an accessible way for your audience, right? So you have to get it right, and then also for your audience, it has to be intuitive. Um, the kind of uh, approach that Fox, Steffensmeyer, and Jones advocate, and this is kind of the incumbent duration model book in political science, is that they say, all right, so instead of hazard ratios, think about doing percent change in the hazard. And this actually makes sense, whether or not it's evident at first. Because in some ways, it's recognizing that, okay, like H of T is miserable, right? As far as, again, it's not a particularly intuitive quantity, thinking about instantaneous risk. But at least we've seen percents before. <laughs> we have seen percents before, and we've seen them in different contexts. So at least there's a shot now uh, that when we're communicating to our audience, right, that small bit of familiarity will help. Our approach is, of course, just avoid the hazard altogether. And of course, John and Jeff's approach is also just avoid the hazard altogether and think about a different quantity entirely. So the point is, there are multiples of us working on more intuitive ways to interpret the output from these models to lower the, uh, the perceived startup cost of using them. And the solution Ben and I proposed, and this is kind of like the uh, movement two of our paper, uh, is that uh, transition probabilities are actually a way to go. Uh, these probabilities are calculated from the hazards but the way in which they are calculated from the hazards translates them into probabilities, and probabilities we have heard of before and seen in other contexts, right? So it's just like, yes. Uh, spiritually, these are relatives of predicted probabilities out of logit, but they are not exactly the same numerically. So I just want to give you a sense of like, yeah, they're in that kind of family, right? They are a probability. Uh, and how these are estimated and how they're interpreted is this, right? So if you have a transition probability, uh, these represent the probability that your subject of interest, let's say a pair of states, uh, ex is experiencing a war, right? so an event of interest, uh, by a particular point in time, given three things that you then choose as the researcher. Uh, what we describe as the starting point time covariate profile. So by starting point, we simply mean it's like, all right, are these pairs of states currently at peace or are they at war? And you want to see the probability that they would still be at war like 10 years down the line. That's something you can run with these quantities. Uh, something you also have to pick starting time. Did this piece just start between these two states, right? So like time would be equal to zero. Or have they maybe been at peace for 50 years already? And you want to see what's the probability that they'll still be at peace in 60 years? It is a choice that you make as a researcher, right? And if you're wondering, well, what guidance? This is unfortunately the same kind of general guidance as uh, choosing covariate profile values, which is uh, choosing values that substantively are relevant for what you're trying to demonstrate. So the math will, of course, calculate anything you give it. But from our perspective as applied researchers, some values are more uh, productive to choose than others when it comes to advancing the point you're trying to make. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Different. So uh, f of t, which is what you were describing, uh, the failure probability, will be equivalent to a transition probability if it is the case that you have uh, a subject that can experience the event once and then never again. That's the only time they'll be equivalent. Otherwise, if you have this back and forth, right, like they won't be the same. Um, and this is why uh, part of why we like these quantities so much is that they generalize to any uh, number of complex situations that you may be trying to model right, as a political scientist. So they will be equivalent there. Uh, if you have a competing risk situation, this will be equivalent to the SIF, so the cumulative incidence function. But again, if you have anything more complicated than that, right, like this is just an entirely different animal. right? So those two things I mentioned are kind of specific cases of uh, transition probabilities. <laughs> 
Uh, but you need to pick the starting point, you need to pick the starting time. I'll also point out when you choose these out of R, it's choosing these for you by default because the starting point is usually you haven't experienced the event yet. And then also it starts calculating this from time zero if you look along the, uh, the horizontal axis uh, to see the gradations that are along there. And then the final part though is the, uh, the one that's not duration model specific in any way, which is choosing a covariate profile. And so for cl clarify fans out there, this is set X, right? So maybe you choose the medians, maybe you choose the means. Uh, at the moment, this is uh, the extent of the functionality we have is inserting uh, values and then calculating. So do all of this and then transition probabilities can be yours for a very low price because uh, we have packages for these to calculate them for you. So in R, this is the M state package. Uh, this comes to us from a group of biostatisticians. Right? So it's been kicking around for a while. I think it's now nine years old, about there. And if you're a Stata person, we also now have a package for you because Ben and I wrote it. So this is the M state Cox package. Uh, you can read about it. Uh, we have our Stata journal piece. It just came out a couple months ago that describes the package. Uh, but both of these functionally do the same thing. Uh, we have a few more bells and whistles that we're very proud of. And we also have a code update coming within the next four weeks that makes it run even faster, which we're also very proud of, so watch for that. But my point in mentioning this to you is, like, there are packages that do this for you, right? It's not like you have to be typing out manually all of the code to calculate these quantities, right, given uh, the mathematical expression. So long as you understand what it's doing, just like any command that you would ever use in R and Stata, right? you would estimate your Cox model, you would choose your starting point, starting time, covariate profile. Then you would run the transition probabilities, right? And that would be that. But of course, the best way to usually talk about a new quantity is to show it in the field, as it were. Right? So for this last few slides, what I'm going to talk through is, you know, a situation where we're going to model a set of data uh, using kind of the incumbent approach, right? So logit probit, not checking for pH, no causal complexity, right? And then showing what happens when we do adjust for those things to illustrate um, whether the results change, right, and just how drastically they could change. So for our purposes, we decided to look at the democratic piece just because it's easiest to describe. So what we're going to look and see is for a pair of states, uh, given the one of them that's less democratic, how does that state's democracy level affect whether the pair of states on the whole is in a mid, right, so a militarized interstate dispute, so threat display use of force by one state towards another and military force specifically. And the way we usually model this is, okay, right, like the pair of states are at peace. Uh, they then, like a mid starts, right, so this would be onset, that's what the arrow would represent. And then from our data sets perspective, like, like things then disappear, right, like we don't really model what happens once they're in a mid, right, like, like there is a, a mystical black box. And then sometimes these states just then reappear at peace again, right? So point is, we know they're in a mid, but again, we don't tell the regression this. So from the regression's perspective, these states just, just go away. Pairs of states go away. Uh, so if we run, you know, we did this with Cox model, again, very vanilla Cox model. Uh, we ran the transition probabilities, this is what we get. So we set all of the covariates to their median and then varied, uh, the seven, did the 75th and 25th percentile for that least democratic state in the dyad. Um, this is all through simulation, right? So this is a thousand simulations. And along the x-axis, this is time, right? So time since uh, these two pairs of states, these two states have been at peace. So we picked zero as our starting time. And then we also said that these states were at peace. That was our starting point. Then along the y-axis, that is the transition probability, right? It's in probability terms. And just by eyeballing this, mids are incredibly rare which is something that interstate conflict folks can tell you, but if you did not know, now you do. Uh, but to zoom in a little bit more to show you what these actually look like, so notice how we get CIs out of this quite easily because this is through simulation, right? So we can get uncertainty bands. And what you can see is, right, it's like, all right, these look like predicted probabilities, but they're, again, not the same. So how would you interpret these, right? What makes that interpretation different? Uh, let's just take the 20th year as an arbitrary example. Right, so what this is telling us is that given the pair of states that we were looking at uh, has you know, covariate values for the, the controls, that everything's at its median, uh, and that least democratic state in the dyad is a very, very consolidated autocracy at a negative eight, 
Uh, at the 20 year mark, uh, this pair of states has a 3% chance of being in a mid, right? whether that's a mid that's just started or ongoing, just a 3% chance of being here. Now contrast that with a dyad where everything is exactly the same except for that polity score, which we've now increased towards the democratic side of this tail, and it's now at negative two. Now the probability of being in a mid drops significantly. So at the 20 year mark, there's a little bit less than a 2% chance that you would be in a mid at 20 years, given that you were at peace to start and you just became at peace to start, right? So time equals zero. Uh, so this is how you would interpret these. And we do have lots of examples of interpretation, both in our joint work together in this paper and then also in our solo work. And we're more than happy to provide you with as many examples as you would like, if that would be helpful. So just let us know. Uh, all of this up to this point, though, again, I said this is using the same sort of setup we do now, no pH check, and then also no causal complexity, right? The idea that's like, all right, well, there's peace. These two states could be in a mid and then could move back to peace. Right? And this is where we're going to start finishing up for today, right? What Ben and I then do is, all right, so let us run a Cox model that has this causal complexity that allows us to, through the model, Acknowledge the fact that pairs of states may be at peace. Uh, the mid may start, and there may be pH violations in this transition, right? So some of the covariates may be conditional on time. The state will then be in a mid, right? Like that mid is ongoing, and then the question is, all right, well, how long until it ends? And we recognize that here too, right? There are covariates, and that these covariates may be conditional on time. So we ran this model, checked for the pH violations. You can do all of this with our M state Cox package. We do find several pH violations, one of which is democracy, right? So the variable we're theorizing about. And once we uh, control for the pH violations appropriately, right? So correct model specification, causal complexity, and run the transition probabilities, this is what we get. So visually already you see this is quite, quite different than what you saw a few slides ago, right? This is all sorts of mountainous action here. And what at least generally we take from this at this point is that uh, shortly after the piece begins is kind of the point where there is the highest probability of a mid then recurring. But then notice what we see, which is like then the probability that you're in a mid at the 10, 20 year mark decreases. And that should make sense to you once I mention that most mids only last a year or two, right? So it's not continuing on and on and on and on, but that's precisely what you're doing. And this goes to Dan's question earlier when you don't acknowledge that two pairs of states are in a mid, but then are transitioning back. Right? So what the transition probabilities are doing is acknowledging this movement back and forth. Right? This is why they represent at this point in time, what's the probability that this pair of states will be like, in the mid stage? Uh, follow up question there. Yes. When you're, when you're modeling uh, complex data, which my understanding is that in any complex data, is that you can jump from state to state, and where you're modeling the fact that that's a fair uh, description. Are, are you, it would seem to me that the model is presuming that the process that leads from a zero to one and the process that leads from a one to zero is the same except the reverse, right? So it's the same set of covariates involved mm -hmm. in either process. Is it constraining implicitly the coefficients on one to be the negative of the coefficients on the other? Yeah. Uh, it, is it is not. So with okay. these models, you can have completely different sets of covariates for the, for the two processes. Yeah. You can have the same set. You can then use the statistical test we know to see if the coefficients are the same across the two instead of just imposing it. Because right? we also know it's like, well, if we can collapse things to make the model simpler, we're going to do that. But the model is not making that assumption yeah. at all. Right? It's something that's estimated. And at the extreme, everything can be a free parameter and estimated. And then the place I'll end, and this goes to a couple of your different questions, right? You can see visually that this is very different than the slide I showed you uh, before last, where we had the predictive probabilities out of uh, just a straight, plain vanilla Cox. But the question is, well, just how different? And this is something hard to appreciate because you may not have noticed this, uh, but the scale on the y-axis changed. So if I put all of these on the same slide for you, right, uh, this is the difference in the predictive quantities. Notice that the substantive conclusions you would draw are vastly, 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 vastly different. Uh, so these very, very light gray lines are the 
transition probabilities out of a logit, so you can technically calculate them out of that. For this simple case, and by simple I mean, this would be like the straight vanilla logit that we currently all calculate when we model these data. Right, so point is, it's an apples to apples comparison. Right? Uh, so these are the transition probabilities from the logit. Uh, this medium gray set of lines, these are the basic Cox probabilities you did see a slide or two ago. And then these are the acknowledging onset and ongoing may be different, and then also acknowledging there may be pH violations. Right? That is several orders of magnitude of difference when it comes to the probability of experiencing emit at a particular point in time. And this is why, in particular, we argue that the Cox can be so powerful because it can handle these sort of complex situations uh, with far less effort on your part. And as I alluded to, we have some evidence that sometimes the logit just won't estimate because of how complex things like this can get with the number of estimates you're, you're making. And then also, second, that the Cox sometimes outperforms the logit. Right, not always. Usually it's you know, a pretty fair, even deal. Uh, but for some of the baseline hazards we've checked, the Cox actually does appreciably better, like in a way that was shocking to us. Uh, so all of this comes back to, right, what now do we take as the conclusion from this talk as we consider and continue our cons uh, conversation, right? So what Ben and I have argued is next time you have a BTSCS question, uh, you should think about giving Cox duration models a shot. And we know they have a bad rep because of their interpretability, uh, but what we've offered you is an alternative to the kind of incumbent approaches that are out there, which are all centered around the hazard. Right? We've given you these transition probabilities, which are probability-based, a lot more intuitive to work with, and we think also to explain uh, to your readers. Right? The Cox's main virtue is that it makes, like even thinking about the baseline hazard a non-issue, and oftentimes that's fantastic because we don't care about the baseline hazard, as many of you were pointing out. Right? We just need to acknowledge it in a way that doesn't mess up the rest of our estimates. Right? It allows for pH violations to be very easily corrected. And we also have some very, very small set of internal simulations we ran that suggest tentatively that the pH tests for the Cox model also perform better than the pH tests out of the logit when it comes to correctly detecting violations versus not. So just in case the canned um, nature of the pH tests for a Cox weren't enough to sway you, slight additional evidence to, to, for your consideration. And then the Cox is also very, very adaptable. And you saw this here in this kind of very simple case where there was just onset and then how long the mid stayed ongoing. It can go way more complex than that, right? And I'm more than happy to talk about those situations for you. And we do talk about them in our other work together. And on the whole, what this goes to is one of the questions that Dan was asking about, right? So like, who cares to what end? Uh, by recognizing that while you may only care about one of these transitions in the model, right? So like onset, by failing to recognize this is one small piece of a far larger process that I'm theorizing about. Maybe I'm not making an argument about it, right? but it's still part of this larger process. Uh, you have the potential to, to grossly, in this case, overestimate the probability of being uh, in a mid between two states. So what our approach gives you is a way to have a much more holistic perspective of the entire process you're theorizing about. Uh, and in doing so, giving you a chance to have better estimates than you would have otherwise. And with that, I would love to continue the conversation that we have started uh, as the talk was going on. Uh, so questions, comments, thoughts? Thank you. Open to the floor. If, so again, Dave, Dave and then John, we'll just, we'll just do the horn. Yeah, so so my, I have a quick question, and then Ben can pick up on this for me because, so Ben and I started doing some work two days ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what what yeah. can I say, right? Like yeah. a duration model, it's all about timing. <laughs> Um, so we're, we're, we're working with um, MIDS data, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I don't say that proudly, but right, that's, that's the nature of the beast. I'm, in, I'm intrigued by the, the second stage, right, the second part of the model. Because one of the things that we've talked about is the idea of onset, then duration, then termination. Right now, I appreciate that what you're saying, that these MIDS are usually pretty short lasting. Right? But let's, let's ignore that empirical, yeah, yeah. empirical regularity. We've got an argument that suggests that, you know, that, there, that there's a, very, a magic variable out there that can help us understand uh, the propensity to go to war in a diet. Right? It, it could potentially also tell us something about, given that a war has occurred, 
the, the conflict between the two sides or the length of the war should be less. If a war has happened before? No, no. No, sorry, I didn't hear that, that condition. No like the war no would war. be shorter. Yeah, that the war would be shorter. Is there, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious about this, this second stage in your model, mm -hmm. right? So tell me how you model these things simultaneously within the framework of a COX. Yeah. Uh, so within the framework of a COX, what you're essentially doing is for data setup, you're like stacking the data, right? Which is just a very, yeah. I'm not going to say, it's a very meat and potatoes concern, but you're structuring the data in a particular way. Uh, so we talk about this in our PA and our JCR. Again, more than happy to share those with you as well as the kind of current working version of this. So we're in the middle of um, some additions, but I'm again happy to share the last big version uh, with you all. Um, and then as far as how I would think about this, right, uh, so what you did just tell me is that, right, there is a, a, uh, a peace state, and then, right, like, states can go to a mid. Uh, let's just say this is just any mid. Uh, but then you said you're interested in whether or not this, in a way, escalates to war. No, so let's, let's just well, say, it's, it's let's say that, that you have a mid, mm -hmm. right? And then there's a related question, which is to say, how long does that mid last? Right, yes. Uh, so this is exactly what the, the, the model is, is doing. Okay. So recognize that when you say questions about mid-termination, that would be synonymous uh, to asking a question about the mid's duration, right? Because right. how yeah. long it is right. will be, um, will depend on when the termination event happens, and that's what uh, the second stage is modeling. So in a big table uh, where you would run this, right? This is what a table would look like. Uh, where uh, this first column represents all the covariates for this arrow, right? So the factors corresponding to mid-onset. Uh, so we see, for instance, if we just look at the transition-specific covariates, we see that uh, the more democratic the dyad is, the less likely it is to go into the mid-stage in the first place. Uh, we see that the farther apart the dyad is, the less likely they are to go to, into a mid in the first place, right? So the point is, this is the same general interpretation uh, at the moment. The second column is looking at mid-termination now, so mm -hmm. how long it's lasted. Right, so what we see here, for instance, is uh, the farther apart two states are, uh, the shorter the mid will be, holding all else equal. Uh, for economic interdependence, the more interdependent the two states are, uh, the more likely it is for the, uh, the mid to end. So things will be uh, shorter here, and I'm sorry, this will be the fact that if you're further apart, it'll be less likely that the mid terminates, so apparently, According to our model, once the mid is ongoing, if you're far apart, that actually keeps the mid going for a while. And if you think about it, that could be for any number of reasons, like, well, if it's so far apart, we may not be actually, uh, our military forces may not be engaging a whole bunch, right? So we don't really have an impetus to, to end it. So my point is simply, it pushes back against what we currently know, but there's also an explanation that makes sense. Uh, so your question about, well, how long does the mid last? Like, that would be this column. And again, this would just be for this specific transition, what are the factors that affect this? And then if you wanted to, like, on the whole, look to see what's the probability that a state would just be in a, in a mid at a particular point in time, that's then where the transition probabilities come in. Because the transition probabilities acknowledge this arrow and this arrow and models how the pair of states jumps back and forth between the two using the Cox estimates. So yes is the really short answer That's to your entire answer. question. Can I just add a, real, a, a, a small follow-up? You can if have I, if, ask a large follow-up too. Unless well, John I want to be get respectful of, of other folks. Um, if I understand this correctly then, mm -hmm. by adding this second, if I'm interested in that second column, right. Right, and I don't model the first column, this is then I'm going to get the same sort of problems with bias uh, uh, that, that you'll for, like, be, for what, transition what probabilities and predicted ahead, probabilities. Right? Mm -hmm. But if I'm uninterested in that second column, mm -hmm. if I don't model it, does that have any any effect on bias in the first column? So the coefficients themselves will be unbiased. What will be biased is the transition probability. Okay, and that's the. Yeah, that's, the, that's the, the graph that you saw right. where it was like, whoo! All right. Um, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, John. Um, so one reason why people use uh, the logit is because they've got x's that vary year to year. Mm -hmm. And the default data set up for a Cox proportional hazard model is one row per case. Um, and there are ways to get time-varying mm -hmm. covariates in there but they're a little bit um, counterintuitive for people 
really used to regression, where instead of having it like country year, it's it's spell, you know. So you might have fifty years, but only like two spells, and mm-hmm. you've got like X in the first spell, X in the second, and time variant covariates that way. So uh, a big part of what uh, of, of what you're proposing for the transition probabilities involves using the Cox model instead of logic. Mm-hmm. So what would you say? to someone who has like a bunch of variables that are different every single year? So that's actually the case for this mid data. Uh, So with the way that, as you implied, there's a way to set up Cox models to uh, handle such time varying covariates. Uh, And with the way that these models are run, like this this data set, right, came to us in dyad year form. So we just added the, like, did the cleanup we needed to, to add the, the mid-duration observations back in. But then otherwise, this is still in BTSCS format. Like, we transform the data not at all into spells. So at least with this, we just converted everything into start-stop data. Um, so it can handle that. And this was one of our concerns as well, right? Because again, if we're going to be advocating, especially for you know, folks that don't use duration models a whole bunch, right, you should try this. Uh, we were very concerned about the fact where it's like, well, it's very easy for us as people that use these all the time to say, do the thing, right? Because we can get the data exactly the way we need it. So we did spend a fair amount of time thinking about this, right? And when we got it to the point where like, just BTSCS is just interchangeable with this, aside from the few additional tweaks you have to make for the stages, um, this is where we started getting really excited. Right? So you can have t- uh, TVCs with this quite easily uh, to the point where, like, the base data set structure is the exact same as it would be for a logit. Cool. Um, and then, uh, sorry, if somebody else had a question. Um, if he got a follow up, you get a follow up. Or a different right. question. Totally fair. <laughs> Buy one, get one. Uh, so, 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 with the, uh, the this is about the, 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 the logit setup, so it's not exactly relevant to, to the main point of the paper, but I, I was just a bit confused when we're. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the thing that makes a logit or, or one of the binary models close to a Cox model is, um, is really data management. What rows do you include in there and what rows do you not include in there? And so in order for the time function, whether it's time dummies or log time or time polynomial, to be a hazard function, you remove the rows after an event has occurred. Because that's what adds, that's what corresponds to the definition of hazard, right? It's, it's like conditional on still being in the data, conditional on not having failed yet. Mm-hmm. Um, if you have multiple spells, where, where it, you know, the piece and mid, then piece and mid again. So different types of spells? Okay. Yeah, different, yeah. Uh, then th- that is, if you have any kind of structure beyond zeros, then one, then it's out. Um, then, then what makes it a hazard function? So McGrath gets into this a whole bunch more in his piece when it comes to the, the back and forth. And at least here, uh, our general take is, um, if you're making an assumption about how the data are generated, um, if you do toss the observations after a mid has started, right, it's, it's a, can be treated as if it's a hazard, right, in this case. If you keep those observations in, there are additional transformations you then have to, to do, right? And again, this is why McGrath has an entire PA on this with, I think he ended up having like several hundred, if not thousands of simulations in there, specifically checking this exact thing. Um, there are ways to make data adjustments to then properly acknowledge that the same way there are two hazards, right? So there's the hazard of piece to mid, which is the one you were alluding to and the one that we natively think of when thinking about mid data, right? or any data where it's just that first transition, right? So like getting reelected, that statute being invalidated, going into a democracy. Um, and then there's also then a second hazard for going back, right? So if you structure the data right, you can get both while following all of the, the, the rules of the road, so to speak. So the short version is it's doable if you're careful, which is another reason we like this because just behind the scenes for the Cox, right? It's doing all of the like the, the hazard rule of the road stuff automatically and very easily once you get things. Um, again, just the, kind of the additional small tweaks you have to make to add in and acknowledge 
when mids are ongoing versus not. Makes you wonder why any political scientists think they know more than Sir David R. Cox. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm not tenured, so I'm not going to throw any <laughs> gauntlets whatsoever at anyone. But just, I, like I think, like many fields, right? Just we, we all end up using the same tools, but we end up getting there from very different places, and things are very path dependent in, the, in you know the conversations we have about them. Right, so, point is not necessarily intentional malice. Right? Could just be path dependence, which is also very appropriate and very political sciency. Yes. There's no sensor data here. You're welcome. Hmm? There's no sensor alterations in this data. Uh, so there can be censoring, but the Cox takes care of it automatically, right? That would just be a like in this case, like a pair of states uh, that stays put, like may still be in a mid when our obs the observations like, are op observing of that pair ended. So. But in the, in the mid case, there would be no sensor. It, I would have to like look to see. I. Did not. I did not put the uh, the transition probability, or pardon me, the, the transition table in here. Um, but there could be, there may not be. But I, we have other applications where yeah, the entire talk in thirty seconds. Here we go. <laughs> uh, there are other applications where we do have. Uh, you know, there is more censoring, and just this is all to say, like the Cox can handle it just fine. So again, it's being taken care of for you behind the scenes, but to some extent that's the, the same as it is in so Logit, right? Like if at the end of the spell, it's like, all right, like these two pairs of states are still at peace in 2000. So in this setup, is this still necessary to model either case fixed defect or year fixed defect here? Do we still need to So repeat the last part again. So I heard so if you do this two-stage mm -hmm. um, uh, Cox model setup, do we still need to care about year fixed effects? No, because that's what the the fact that it's semi-parametric, mm -hmm. right? What year fixed effects are usually doing is proxying for a baseline okay. hazard, and it is the case mathematically that if you write everything out, right, like a Cox model uh, is mathematically equivalent to a, a conditional log log or a C log log with uh, with time dummies, um, but there are then different estimation issues because as, as we know anytime you estimate a whole bunch of fixed effects Sita and R love you a lot for all of those those additional uh, estimates that you're asking out of it and uh, this is why you heard me say a few times there are some situations where like the logit or the probit just may refuse to estimate and this is partially why right if you have a whole bunch of dummies like this maybe you have lots of different stages maybe you then want to allow the covariate effects to differ for each of those stages right going to Dan's point you now have yeah. a lot of covariates, and again, it, you know, regression is not magic. You, you need everything you're asking of it. You need to be giving it sufficient information. So, by estimating in particular, like the baseline hazard for the logit and probit, like this, this is again sometimes what can cause it not to estimate because two, you can't just stick in one set of time dummies because that would be oh, the baseline hazard going in is the same as the baseline hazard going out, right? Which this was one of, in some ways, a variant of Dan's question, right? Like, are you just imposing, like, equality between these two? It's like, well, you are if you do that. But you can allow the baseline hazard to be different. But if you're modeling it with uh, time dummies in a logic context, that means that however many transitions you have, multiply that number by your number of time dummies, and that's how many covariates at minimum will be in your model, right? So they can become very, very unmanageable very quickly. Which is another reason we're like, just, just, just do the Cox, right? You don't even have to then think about your fixed effects, because again, what that's proxying for is the, uh, the baseline hazard. Additional questions? Last call. Well, I, I, I okay, there we go. <laughs> See, it's the key, right? Making it sound like this is your last chance. Well, I guess I want to get back to. Uh, 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 you call me Dan. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, is this the construction where it's like, I want to refer to the professor, but I, I like his given name? Yeah, I was uh, trying to recall that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid that it's the it's kind of, it's a theoretical point of view. Like when and whether, there are different questions, right? So In what sense? So for example, so, so right now I'm working on a project trying to model 
after a domestic terrorist attack, mm -hmm. how long it will take for the Chinese government to officially report this attack okay. in their government newspapers. So then we find um, here are actually two questions. One is, are they going to acknowledge it, which is about censor or not censor? And the second question is, are they going to report it in their own newspapers? So, so it's not really a whether and when they're not the same here. What? What's the the quick, quick dis mm -hmm. dis dis distinction? So I heard the re reporting part is ultimately there are different ways they can report, or just it's question of do they end up reporting it? Yeah. So so let me give you a more concrete example. So I thought I was understanding you, and then like for the end syntax, I was like, did you just throw in another outcome? So yes, yes, context, please. So I guess. So that was a categorical outcome. You just described to me it a, is a multinomial. Uh, Framework where it's is it multinomial or a two-stage question? Like in the first stage, your decision making is we're not going to censor this information, and in the second stage is I'm going to report it myself or I'm going to start a propaganda on it myself. So it's kind of a, so it's, it's, it's zero. I'm not going to acknowledge. I'm going to acknowledge through one venue, and then I'm going to acknowledge through. Basically yes. the so the first even there was zero and one. So we can observe the least this. amount of structure would be sort of a pure multinomial, right? Where you're treating these things as completely uh, separate. But then it sounds almost like it's a. Are you envisioning like a hurdle structure? Acknowledge, don't acknowledge, and if you do acknowledge, and how long is the selection now? Like, so you know, you're selecting into a different. Well, what I'll point out in general, though, is anytime you're using just a logit or a cox in general, what you're implicitly assuming is that for any of the like the spells you're looking at, eventually, if you watched long enough, your event would happen, yeah. right? So that's to be distinguished with a part of what I think you may have been alluding to, which is there may just be some yeah. uh, terrorist attacks after they happen that like the Chinese government has a like a structural zero percent chance of acknowledging, yeah. and that is a entirely different problem. So this is now like a split population problem in a duration model context. Uh, so my point is simply, uh, first for that, there's actually a much bigger question in there than you think. So it's going to depend on the assumption you want to make about whether all a post-terrorist attack, whether all the spells are at risk right, or capable, have a chance of the Chinese government acknowledging the attack happened. Right, because then implicitly this then goes to at least your second question. So like if we temporarily, we do take that assumption, which is to say, yes, all of them could have the Chinese government acknowledge them. Right? So we're just going to take that one for now. Right? And now your second, the, the question you were asking, which is like, well, there's actually two in here. It's like, well, no, but not really. I mean, so there's, because if the Chinese government never acknowledges in the period that you're watching things, then it's just right censored. Right, again, from an assumption perspective, it's, well, if I had watched this long enough, I would see an acknowledgment. If I watched it long enough, right, and of course, whether you do watch it long enough, or whether there are other events that could prevent you from watching it long enough, like maybe another terrorist attack kind of restarts the clock, so to speak, right? Uh, but that would just be right censoring, right? Like, in the sense that it's, you're, you're in the stage, you're in the stage, you're in the stage, you're in the stage, right? And the, the Cox is dealing with that automatically for you. So the point is it's not like a conscious decision you have to think through, right? It would just be a question of doing the transition probability. If you would like, for instance, in, in this case, it would just be as simple as is f of t seeing what's the probability that you will have acknowledged this tech attack by this particular point in time. And if they haven't acknowledged the attack, it's like, all right, well, like it, it is censored. But my point in trying to phrase it that way is that there's nothing you have done up before that point to be like, oh, censoring, censoring. The Cox is doing it for you, right? Like the, the very end part is just interpreting it in that way. So from that perspective, right, like the, the thinking about censored versus not, again, that's actually a whole additional assumption that we just kind of made for dis, uh, discussion's sake to make things tractable. And then the second thing you were asking, which is, you know, the government could acknowledge, it could, so I guess this question is now also conceptual. Do you see this as mutually exclusive outcomes, right? So they could acknowledge, they could just not acknowledge, but then just start propagandaing, or they do both, 
So, uh, so talk to me, I guess, how you're envisioning uh, the next set of possibilities. So I guess my point is um, when you look at the data, mm -hmm. you can see uh, this event is acknowledged in the government newspaper. Mm -hmm. This event is not acknowledged in the government newspaper. Then in another column, you can see, OK, it takes them two days to acknowledge this right. event. And then it takes them, let's say, a month to mm -hmm. acknowledge this event. So, um, um, and we're trying to convince people that these two decisions are made, um, or they're influenced by different factors. So, I'm sorry, could you explain? When does the duration begin? The duration begins the day the attack happened. Okay, so, so you, and then, are all attacks covered in the newspaper? No, so there are some red censor. So you, but, but you know in your data all the attacks? Yes. Whether or not they were in the newspaper? Yes. Okay, and then the first duration is how long it takes until what? Until it first time appeared in the government newspaper. Okay, until it appears in the government newspaper. Yeah. And then the second duration is what? There's, there's actually no second there's say There isn't a second one? So you're just you're you're thinking about the, the fail variable and the duration variable is separate, so which again just conceptually. Or, or, or I can say that like there's a third column and all these kind of things, I would say ninety percent of them appeared in the social media in China, but not in the government newspaper. Okay. They appeared in the social media means they're not officially censored in China. So the government allow people to discuss it but they do not want to discuss it in their own newspaper. So you know so we how long it took for it to be mentioned on social media? Uh, yes. OK, so and you have a newspaper duration and a social media duration, yeah, but both of which have right censor. Um, yeah, potentially yes, right potentially if it never yes. appears in. But the social media appearance, there's not a lot of variation there. It's usually just one day. It happened, then it appeared in the social media, it, which means the government didn't censor that. Oh, I see. So the duration yeah. doesn't matter very right. much. It doesn't matter very much. I think part of our problem is we're using censoring, because censoring has a very specific meaning in the duration context, but oh, you're yeah. talking about, yeah. right, well, like, press yeah. censoring, right? right? And I think that's part of our problem. It's like, yeah. wait, yeah. what? Right, right, right. right, so, like, right censoring, this is why I was like, that's not going to be an issue. I'm so talking about press censoring. Price censor. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so there. But, but it is the same in this case, because if it's censored, as it's long censored. as he's making, yeah, as long as he's making the assumption that everything oh. is at risk of being reported, right, yeah. so there are no immune units. Right, and that's probably, you know if that's right or not, but mm -hmm. it, it might be that some events will not be covered, period, come hell or high water a thousand years or a million, right? But, I mean, yeah. it's, yeah. The, and that was actually a question I had about the mid-state. Are we presuming and using Cox models that for any two pairs of countries, if an infinite amount of Yeah, time, so it is, it's assuming everyone's at risk, everyone, but I'll also point out, Okay. Every logit model that isn't a um, like a bivariate with partial observability is doing the exact same thing, right? If you have all pairs of states, your implicit assumption there is that every single one of these states so Uganda, could experience Uganda and Bolivia could go to war, just like it could in a yeah in a, in a logit probit BTFCS. But you can use strata to make them have different baseline. Yeah, so this is actually when you use models like this. This goes to Dan's question about like yeah, you can have different covariate effects but you're also stratifying, and that's what gives the baseline hazards, um, allows them to have different values. And since, again, it's a semi-parametric model, you're not explicitly estimating anything for that. So this is why the Cox can sometimes estimate a lot more complex things than the Logit and Probit can, because that's when you start running into like the degree of freedom issues, because you do have to explicitly estimate every single term for a baseline hazard. And if you have multiple transitions where you want to allow multiple baseline hazards for each of them, things start getting unpleasant, again, from a, a maximization perspective. Well, thank you so much. Huh? Well, thank you for letting me come.